This is episode 13b of the Interdisciplinary History Podcast. Content warnings in this episode for mentions of sexual assault and abortion. Hi everyone, this is Victoria. And I'm Sloane. And welcome to the Interdisciplinary History Podcast. This is part two in our Alias Grace series. Episode 13B, where today we will be talking about gender sexuality as well as social class. Yeah. Victoria, take it away. Thank you, Sloan. In Alias Grace, Margaret Atwood examines gender norms of early Canada through the story of Grace. I find this really interesting because you sort of see mixtures of gender and sexuality in Grace's sex of society and in the sex of society of Dr. Jordan, who is the psychologist analyzing Grace and her actions, trying to figure out whether or not she's guilty. Grace's story is very connected to gender and sexuality because it's also connected to class. Both in her flashbacks and in her present, you sort of see the differences between gender and sexuality in social classes of the era. Specifically for Grace as a person who is working class, and for Dr. Jordan, who is a person of a wealthy background and who has a a significant education. I don't know where really to start because I feel like I should discuss Dr. Simon Jordan first. He is a man who is unsure of himself. His family is losing wealth because his father has passed away, revealing significant deaths. And Simon Jordan wants to have his own psychiatric institution that he can run himself using uh, new ideas and new research done in the era on psychology. And he is examining Grace, who is both a woman and a person who has been convicted of a crime. He wants to understand her. But really, from the beginning, we have ideas that Dr. Simon Jordan is attracted to Grace. She's a very beautiful person, both in the TV show and in the book. As the show progresses, we see Simon Jordan's decline in morals and in his sexuality. Because the more he is attracted to Grace, the more he sort of degrades himself. Because he's also got the situation. He's staying in a rented lodging with his landlady, who has been left by her husband. And in this time, of course, being without a husband or being without a partner or a father figure or some sort of patriarchal control, women are in danger of being put out on the street. And that's really what uh, Simon's landlady is worried about. And women are also being viewed as a dangerous component if they're not properly supervised exactly. by a responsible patriarchal figure. Yeah, and also just having a sort of chaperone in general, because in the early episodes we see there is a moment between Dr. Jordan and his landlady where his landlady faints after bringing up his lunch. And it's because she hasn't eaten in days because the uh, cook has quit and she doesn't have any real skills to cook food. Dr. Jordan is now in a difficult place because he is basically alone with this unchaperoned woman. He's also trying to put forward this idea of a reputation. He's trying to build rapport in the community in Kingston at the time. Yes. And I suppose in the book, the cook quits. In the TV show, it's a matter of the husband's run away, so there is no money for the house. Yes. Yeah. So that is part of it. She quits because there is no money. She is not being paid. She does go to work at the warden's house, and she comes back in a later episode, the cook, on the day of the seance. She's the one who's bad-mouthing Dr. Jordan. Oh, that's... That, yeah, so that's a little no- thing that people would notice. The show leaves that out, but that's entertaining. Yes, in the book, it, it's left in, and Grace is just sort of like, oh... This is the Dr. Jordan I'm seeing? And yeah, so there's that. And basically also Dr. Jordan has expectations for his role in society because he is a man of wealth, he's a man of influence. People don't know that his finances are actually quite unstable at this point. There's this expectation that he will marry, and that's why the warden's daughters are so forward with him. Like, going and leaving their samplers for him and Grace to peruse. And Grace is very aware of this. She is also very aware of him. Do you want to explain to our audience what a sampler is? Oh, I'm so excited you asked. A sampler is basically a section of embroidery that a person who is learning embroidery and such will show their skills. In the show, they also have a scrapbook of stuff that they could go through, of things that they find interesting. One of those is being Grace because Grace is a curiosity. And I think that's where I'm going to switch into the discussion of Grace. 
Grace is working class. She comes from a family where she is forced to basically live on her own very quickly because her father is a failed patriarch. And, and I talked about this in the previous episode. He doesn't provide for his family and he's He's a bad father because he takes all their money and uses it all up on drink. He doesn't use it to pay the rent. And he is also an abuser. He physically assaults his children and he uh, attempts to sexually molest Grace. And this is where we sort of go into her next stage of life, which is where she goes to the Alderman Parkinson's. She's sort of growing into a woman. She's still young. She's 12 going on 13. During this time there, she meets a friend named Mary. And Mary, she's very young. She's 16, but she's older than Grace. So Grace sort of looks up to her as an older sister, or at least just someone that she can admire at this time, because she doesn't have that sort of influence. Grace does have siblings, older siblings, but they're not in the show. So she doesn't have anyone just to really sort of provide that guidance for her. There's one scene that I think is really interestingly done in the show. Because Grace gets her first period. And for this era, 13 is very young. It was quite common for girls to get their periods much later. It's so casual because Grace gets it and she, of course, is thinking, I'm dying. Something is going on with me. She's worried that it's something like her mother passing away on the ship over and she's extremely concerned. Whereas Mary, she's like, well, this is normal. We'll just get you a red flannel petticoat and then give you some willow bark tea. This is really interesting because it really reflects the era's ideas of how we should talk about menstruations. Because in a lot of doctoral work from the time, there just really isn't any discussion of it, like even from Florence Nightingale, like nothing, because it's such a taboo subject. It's that common knowledge that's passed down from generation to generation with women, and it was seen as something embarrassing that needed to be hidden and not discussed at all. Yeah. Yes, and not something that you're typically going to be prepared for. Obviously, there's a lot of debate to be had about how sexually repressed the Victorians actually were. Not as much as you think. Yeah, the Victorians were pretty horny. <laughs> yeah, but the gender divide and the ideals behind femininity really did emphasize uh, passivity, really emphasizing innocence. Obviously, uh, virginal status is significant in this time still. So there isn't a lot of records of discussion of this is going to happen. It's just, this happens and you don't talk about it now. This is how you deal with it. The red petticoats and that sort of thing. The red petticoat is very, very interesting to me. Obviously, there's the practical, you know, stains and whatnot. But we see uh, depicted in the show the sort of menstrual garments that are being used. Uh, and they're actually really mm. well reproduced for the purposes of the show. But it's certainly not a secret to men, uh, people who do not get periods, once you reach adulthood, what that red petticoat means. And there's a very, in this time period, my understanding is that there's a real taboo about being with a woman while she's menstruating. So this red petticoat somewhat signals to men folk that position that this woman's in right now. Yes, and I think it's also important to note how at the time, there's an amazing book on this as Unmentionable by Therese O'Neill. She goes really in depth on it and she has a whole section basically on the things that people would use as a menstrual pad at the time. She discusses really amazingly, and it's really sad, but she goes into great de detail about how periods were s linked to sexuality because they're like, oh, you get your period? You had a dirty thought. Basically, periods at the time could be, they would come later and, and it was really just based on nutrition. And so the reason why we get periods earlier is because we have better nutrition now than we did before. That's basically it. But people would get their periods quite young. They're like, oh, you must be sinning. Yeah, there's not a lot of room to get away from sort of the religiosity that still yeah. defines culture in this time period. And I think the mm -hmm. show does a very good job of that when Mary Whitby in the very, very brief, this just happens now. It happens once yeah. a month now. This is how you keep yourself clean during it explanation that she gives in the show. Perhaps she says more in the book, perhaps as an audience we're meant to understand that she's saying more, it's just not being shown on screen. Uh, but she makes a remark that some people call this Eve's curse. I think Eve's real curse was having to put up with Adam. Yeah. So many of the taboos, because they are 
religiously justified. And I'm not going to suggest that these taboos exist in scripture. I'm going to suggest that these taboos exist because of understandings of religion in this time period, uh, specifically Christian religion. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to me that even just the colloquial ways that we refer to these things. And it's very interesting that you bring up religion in this because, once again, referring back to Mary Whitney's quote about like Eve's curse being to put up with Adam, Theresa Neal once again goes into great detail on this and it's basically discussing how there is no religious basis on women getting painful periods or periods in general just as repercussions for taking a forbidden fruit in Eden. Childbirth, that's the punishment. Going through pain in childbirth. Yeah. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the characters. I want to actually talk about our impressions of pre-Confederation Ontario that this show provides yeah. to us. But one of the other things that I think is very interesting in showing the way that that religiosity shapes a particular individual's worldview is when Mary Whitby ultimately dies from complications connected to an underground abortion that she has. Grace believes that that is the actual punishment of these curse, or she makes a remark about that as a way of understanding it. Yeah, I was really excited to see that, and this is very interesting and very off-topic, but another show, once again created in combination with CBC and Netflix, Penny also has a subject on this, menstruation in the Victorian period. I just think it's so interesting and we're seeing that depicted in media. I didn't grow up with it, I didn't, I just didn't see that on television, so it was really exciting for me to see that. Anyways, so so going back to gender and sexuality, in the previous episode, I mentioned a certain TV show called Houdini and Doyle. So no, I, no, I'm, there's a point to this. There is a point to this. And we talked about how Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was a spiritualist. And I think it's important to talk about spiritualism and its connection with the female gender. Yes. So, yes. Spiritualism does end up playing a part like, we do see that depicted in Alias Grace as well. Yes, to kind yes. Of, that's why I was going back I'm, to that. I'm trying to reassure our listeners that uh, the topics stated about 10 minutes ago are going to appear in this episode. Yes, because we've talked a little bit about gender. It's interesting because this show really depicts the sort of connection between gender, sexuality, and spiritualism in early Confederation Canada. Spiritualism, at the time Alias Grace is set, it's... Seeing its rise, it, it becomes extremely popular. In Canada, we see a rise in Ontario specifically. If you've heard of the Fox Sisters, they're sort of the two women who kickstarted this movement. Uh, they were actually born in Ontario, although they moved to America. They moved around, and basically they helped popularize this movement by uh, communicating with the dead, even though apparently, according to one of the sisters, they were faking it. Yes, I, I'm going to firmly say that most of the spiritualists were faking it. Yeah, they were, for sure. I just think it's an interesting connection We see the Fox sisters. But also in Canada, we have the Ackroyd family in Ontario. We have a very popular spiritualist family in Ontario. Anyways, there is a seance that goes on in the show, an accidental seance, so, so to speak, because they hypnotize Grace. And Grace apparently seems to summon the ghost of Mary Whitney inside herself. This is a gender topic because Grace, when she is under sort of that veil and embodying the spirit of Mary Whitney, we don't know if she is or if she's faking it or because, once again, Grace can't be trusted as a narrator. This representation is very close to what at the time was basically the power of the spiritualism amongst women. Basically, spiritualism was a way for women to talk about things that they weren't allowed to talk about in regular society because it was a respectable way for them to bring up things that they couldn't talk about normally because they could blame it on the spirits, they could blame it on the ghosts. The things that Grace says during this scene, they're very vulgar for the Victorian period and it shocks everyone. But everyone seems to accept it because, oh, she's clearly been possessed by a ghost because spiritualism. Basically, she also uses this to talk about how she has noticed the way Dr. Jordan has been lusting after her. Because he has. That scene shows how Victorian repression on gender and sexuality had outlets to talk about these things. It's just they weren't exactly what you would describe as normal because you wouldn't really expect for women to talk about really wild things about their society in a normal setting. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that one of the ways that the audience gets made aware about the sort of idea of proper speech and ladylike speech, uh, shall we say, 
is because so much of the story is told through flashbacks that are testimony that Grace is giving to Dr. Jordan. There's a lot of times where you see a particular character saying something and then you're taken out of that flashback, you're taken back to Grace and Dr. Jordan. And Grace explains, that's just the way so-and-so spoke. There is kind of this nature of she's giving quotation, but she feels compelled to still present herself in a non-vulgar way. Yes. And I actually wanted to talk about the change in Grace's voice, because in the book, Grace is actually, even though she immigrated to Canada quite late, she learns to basically mimic a Canadian accent perfectly. And why I think this is really good that they switched it to an Irish accent for the show is because it subverts people's expectations about her. Grace, we know that she changes herself and her story to fit her audience. So why can't she do that with her accent? Who's to say that she hadn't picked up that accent off of Mary Whitney really quickly? Yes, and accents are absolutely one of those markers that uh, distinguishes you through class in this time period, that distinguishes you in group membership. But it was basically, I was just talking about how Grace uses that to manipulate people's expectations about her and her gender. Grace is a woman. She's a woman who's, who's been convicted of a crime of murder. But people, they're trying to let her off because she's a woman. Because, oh, she can't have done these things. We see how she changes her story so often, and with the idea that she might have been changing her accent. Seeing how she's trying to subvert people's ideas about her gender at the time. And listeners, if you're like me, and you believe that everything should be viewed with subtitles, you may not have noticed the accents. I, I, I watched it on the treadmill, Victoria, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what any of these characters sound like. Um, it's okay. With that, you bringing up her conviction, and the way that her status as a woman both helps her in con her conviction and hinders her in her conviction. Uh, there's a very, very powerful monologue that comes at the start, where she's talking about the difference between being a murderer and being a murderess. She's a murderess. And she talks about how everybody has speculated what she is. And these speculations, I do think, help remind us of the social values in this. It's described as, is she simply not particularly smart? Her co-defendant, who's ultimately is executed, where she's given a stay of execution, He's a man, he's older than her, so she couldn't possibly actually be responsible for this. And you see that real conflict in the way that patriarchy and the social norms and the social values of this period construct things. Because on the one hand, women are weak-willed, they are sinful, they are likely to lead men astray. But on the other hand, Women are weak-willed, they are malleable, they are innocent. Both of those narratives allow for the domination of one gender by another. Exactly. And I think that scene is just so brilliant because Sarah Gadon changes her facial features so quickly. With the dialogue, the idea is like, she's got like noble tendencies or, oh, she's so stupid or something like that. Or she's little better than an idiot. That's basically what people basically say. And she's like twitches her face so quickly. We just sort of see how Grace is trying to ch change up her story as much as people are trying to write it around her. Yeah, and I think that's Margaret Atwood very much uh, trying to make a statement about the yeah. way that to be able to have agency or control over your life as a woman in this time period you had to always be playing off of the expectations of those around you. And that's very much one of those theses that appears in a lot of Margaret Atwood's fiction. Something that I do think that the show, if you were watching it as a casual viewer, you brought up the idea of some people in the course of her trial speculate that she was a little better than an idiot. Yeah. Uh, you have to remember that that is a, that is a medical term this time period. That's not just being like, oh, she's stupid. That's genuinely referring to her not being... Yeah capable of understanding her own actions, understanding her own consequences. Exactly. Yes. It, it's different than in insanity, like it is related to her intelligence, but it's not just someone calling her a mean name. I think that's one piece of language that perhaps, not having read the novel, is maybe better translated in the novel, but I think the casual viewer misses that in the show. 
Yes. They kept on a lot of dialogue for the book. I was really excited to see that. I think it's also important to note that Grace is telling her story again to Dr. Jordan. She's telling it to him all over again years and years later. Because basically he's trying to figure out if she did it or if, she, if her amnesia is really real. In the end, we don't really know. We don't know because that's just the way the story is. And ultimately, not super what you and I are interested in in terms of this episode. You know, like, if, please, viewers or listeners in the comments section, uh, give us your thoughts. If you're going to watch the show, tell us what you yeah. think actually happened. But also tell us what you think of the world that it's shown. Because that's, that's what we're here to analyze this for, is not what do we think these characters did, what do we think their literary motives are, like, that's not what we're interested in, is how well does the show give you an impression of the period the show claims to take place in. Yeah, I also want to talk about how the men in the show are portrayed, because none of them are really good, and I think that's very realistic, is that a lot of... Dr. Jordan, he says he's doing something for Grace, but really he's just suiting himself, he's suiting his own goals, and that's really just the way men use women as at the time, is just they were a means to an end. A means for knowledge, a means for procreation, or a means of production. Because women at the time, they didn't have the place that they do in our society nowadays. It just wasn't a thing. But if we see that, especially with Grace's time at the Alderman and Parkinson's, specifically the relationship with the son and Mary. And I feel like it's important to note here, trigger warning, there will be discussions of grooming. For the time, it was considered very normal for there to be relationships with men in their 20s and girls who were quite young. But I feel like it's important, this is really a failure in the TV series for casting wise, that they didn't try to show just how young the characters are in this show instead of having them be quite older. I understand like child labor loves absolutely. I just think that by having a character who is 16 played by a woman in her 20s, there's something that's lost in translation. And also not having ages be stated. Exactly. Like that's something that we have to remember throughout this series is there's pretty much no actual statement of ages. Uh, Victoria, thank you for having read the book and being able to tell us where that gets grounded. Because otherwise, like, we don't know. We said in the previous episode, they use the same actor for Grace throughout the entire series. Which, continuity-wise, I understand. But also, I think that you just, you don't get to see just the situation for Grace in the story. I feel like they could have done what they did in Atonement, which is having very visually similar actors and then trying to match up the facial features and hair using similar haircuts. That's just what I was thinking. Basically, Mr. Parkinson, I'm talking about the son, not the elder one, he is staying home because he was ill. And during this time, Mary helps take care of him. Grace sees that Mary is pulling away. She's being a little bit different, a little bit irritable, and then she starts to notice Mary's symptoms of early pregnancy because she's, of course, seen it on her her mother many times before and for Grace that is very scary. What I see in this is I see Mary who is a girl who is in a position where she, there is a man who is in a position of power who takes advantage of basically her kindness because she's helping him with his illness and he uses that for his own gains, his own sexual gains. He grooms her to think that she can't tell anyone. He basically grooms her into thinking, maybe her ideas about men are wrong. Maybe this guy will be different. He wants her to think he's different because that's how he gets what he wants. That's basically it. That was the that was often a, a risk at the time, is that men could easily revoke their attentions from a woman, even though they've put them into jeopardy with reputation-wise by getting them pregnant or stuff like that. Yeah. And social class, again, being a very distinct factor in this. The dynamic between a male household member versus a female household servant. In the show, we see more emotional coercion being practiced, which very likely was, because we see that this household does have a lady of the house who's engaged in at least wanting to maintain the reputation of the household in such that she doesn't want servants of ill repute. We see this with the housekeeper as well. Um, so that secrecy becomes in. We also have to remember, and I think the show does a good job yeah. of showing this later on, that brute force is 
absolutely something available for men to use in this time period. We see one of the big factors as to why Grace is motivated to change her working position is because he is trying to get into her room late at night. He is banging on the door. And we see that unchecked aggression that's not being stopped. The show has a lot of dialogue about entitlement. and It's a very accurate and very visceral depiction of the realities that being at a disadvantage due to your gender and your social class put you at. Yes. I think we talked about this a little in the previous episode is just how the intimacy of a household like this, where the servants live so closely and intermingle so closely with the families, there was a lot of sexual abuse during this time in, in domestic service because it was so normalized and also like you can't really talk up about it because they have power. Yes. Normalized and also hidden. Yes. I think that we also see this later on at the Kinnear household that is rural, that has uh, just a smaller number of people there, but that you have a male head of household who's unmarried with other older unmarried men, and you see the way that they feel at liberty to act towards women in front of women. You see the grabbing, you see that sort of stuff. It's very visceral, and I think it does a good job of breaking away from our idealized picture of the past. I think that it's relatively common when we look at media that depicts uh, Regency era, or we look at media that depicts this colonial era, or we look at that. There's usually a lot of discussion about, oh, so-and-so's reputation is ruined, so-and-so will be ruined, this, that, and the other. But Mm -hmm. it's not really shown what that means. Yeah, It's mocked. Like, it's very, very much mocked. It's very much turned into this very kind of shallow, oh, she was alone with him in the parlor for five minutes and everybody's so worried that something happened. Something could have happened. And in many parlors, something did happen. Like, I I think that we have a tendency to Mm -hmm. forget that these fears didn't come from nowhere. And uh, Yes, exactly. And the consequences of pregnancy in this time period viscerally shown. Yes. We see two examples of that, specifically with Mary Whitney, who she's young and she knows that she will be showing soon. And she knows that she d- she basically has no other choice than to get the abortion because she, c- she can't get a husband. And she, in the book, and this isn't said on the show, I think, is that many of the girls who work for the Alderman Parkinson's go and work there because they want to make money for their dowry. She doesn't have a lot of money. She has to ask Grace for money to help her get the abortion. And then we also see with Nancy Montgomery, people saying, oh, well, she had a kid out of wedlock, and then she put it up for adoption and then started working for Mr. Kinnear. And we see two very different situations there. We see we see two very scared women. And while Nancy Montgomery, we don't see that as much in the show, she is clearly very, very scared, like when she first learns that she's pregnant, because that means she's in a dangerous position again, yeah. unless Mr. Kinnear marries her. Because men could, at this time, they could easily get away with siring a bunch of children. Whereas women, they couldn't, because that would mean that they had mouths to feed other than themselves. And it meant social ruin, because then they couldn't get jobs. They couldn't fend for themselves because they don't have a husband, because the society is so gendered and so relies so much on gender. Yeah, Mary Whitney is very aware of the fact that because the reputation of the household is based somewhat on the behaviors of the servants employed there, she recognizes that she will not get to continue to work in a respectable household. And she's very concerned that she's going to end up in factory work, which certainly did happen to a great many young women who found themselves in that position. She's also very fearful that prostitution is going to be one of the only available uh, ways of supporting herself. Yes. Something, again, there's going to be a lot of trigger warnings, which we'll probably put at the start of the episode. Margaret Atwood gives her characters a lot of dialogue to express the fact that a great many women were willing to take very risky uh, medical procedures. Abortions being illegal and therefore not well regulated, not well practiced, and ultimately done in secret. So should something bad happen as a result of that, 
you were already doing something you shouldn't, nobody's going to admit to have performed that procedure on you. I really wish prior to recording yeah. this episode I had thought to bring it up, because I read a fantastic paper earlier in my undergraduate degree on how the medicalization of abortion may actually have made it more dangerous, because it used to be something that midwives perform. And when it becomes medicalized, you've got male-dominated mm -hmm. science that is now decided this is their realm, and there's a dearth of knowledge compared to what a well-trained, experienced midwife who learned through other midwives have. You talking about periods earlier on, how like medical texts can't deny it happens, mm -hmm. but are very uncomfortable talking about it. Uh, if, listeners, I can find that paper, it will be in the show notes for this episode. I think it's important to discuss how, for a long time in Canada's history, contraception and abortions were illegal. They weren't available even so much as talking about it. It was, it was illegal. It was taboo to discuss the idea of family planning. In the book, they uh, do show a lot of Mary Whitney's fear very well, and I wish that they showed it in the show. Mary Whitney's friends with a lot of sex workers, and she sometimes would walk up, race by the street where sex workers would work, basically where she gets the information about the abortionists. She talks to one of her friends who works in that industry, and that's sort of where her story sort of begins to end. I think it's also interesting we discuss how Grace reacts to the revelation of Nancy Montgomery's pregnancy. Because while she doesn't exactly like Nancy, she is scared for her. Nancy, she is quite sick with her morning sickness. This show, it has so many layers and it shows, a, and the actors are really good at portraying that. And it also shows just how complicated female relationships can be. Is that while you can sort of enjoy being around a person, you can also just not like a person. And also you can not like a person, but you can also feel scared and pity for them. And that's also also part of Grace's complication as a character because you don't know if she actually really felt these things or if she's just making it up to make herself seem more sympathetic to Dr. Jordan. And also portraying herself in the way that women are expected to be. Mm -hmm. You have this understanding that the fairer sex should be caring, should be sympathetic, should be empathetic. And I think it's very important, because Grace is agreeing to these interviews because Grace believes that she can present herself as a redeemable woman. And specifically redeemable in the values of the world she lives in, in the values of the society she lives in. So she has to present herself in that way. She has to talk about these horrible things and be affected by them. Because that proves that she has the right gentler emotions that make her redeemable as a woman in this period. Yes. It's also interesting to note how Grace studies how to do this. We see throughout the story that she read extensively about her case and like read something sometimes in the papers and like she is very aware of the what people think about her. And she also says she sometimes would examine the papers that they used in the wash. It's a funny scene. But she does read these papers and stuff and examines the pictures and stuff. Like, she can read, and she is very aware of what society wants through her reading. And she examines society and tries to mold herself towards it, which is why I noticed her accent change, because she is trying to mold herself to fit what society wants her to be. She watches people constantly while she's sewing. Like, she watches Dr. Jordan. She also watches the warden's daughters, and she is very aware of what everyone thinks about her. I did want to talk about all the relationships in this show are dependent on the power dynamics yeah. between the people in them. The landlady, she's interesting because she is attracted to Simon Jordan. In, in the book, she's described as being very overt in her attraction to him, but she's complicated because she's also a woman who's not in power and Dr. Jordan is in the power to protect her as like a mistress as well as his landlady. And all the relationships in the show are those demanding protection as well as abuses of power because you've also seen that with Thomas Kinnear and Nancy Montgomery and as well as Grace's relationships with James McDermott, Jamie Walsh, and Simon Jordan. Even though Simon Jordan doesn't do anything, he still holds a level of power over her. He asks her a lot of deep questions but also a lot of inappropriate questions for the time period, moving against uh, what is considered proper for Victorian society. 
in Grace's relationships, you sort of see a shift between power because in a way she is just as much in power and as the men, but in her own way because she is she's also considers herself to be the victim. Same thing with Jamie Walsh. Yes, he marries her, but she constantly is telling these stories to get him to believe that maybe she she's not who he thought she was when he uh, gave testimony. This show is very complicated uh, in the way it depicts gender and sexuality because at this time it's just so interconnected. I like some of the points you brought up about her age, about her education level, and about the different class expectations and the way they're also playing into gendered expectations. Gagan and Mays write an article that's titled The Pros of Life. And in this article, they are looking at Ontario's economy and social structures prior to 1850, but they're using literary sources. I felt this made a lot of sense to read and to talk about as we're talking about Alice Grace, because we're dealing with fiction, and how well does that fiction give us an impression of real life? These characters, while inspired by true events, we know that they're not, so how well do these characters and their world represent real history? So one of the things that Gagan and Mays suggest is that we can look at the developing society in pre-Confederation Canada and a little bit into post-Confederation. We know this series goes, but the decades leading up to Confederation. They describe it as a social experiment. And what they argue for is looking at this society as it's portrayed in literature and as it's portrayed in primary sources as developing out of the interaction between, quote, raw environment and equally raw human resources. And in the previous episode, when we discussed immigration, we talked about how there's a real breakdown of norms and a real need to reconstruct norms when you've got so many people moving from tight-knit communities into these large urban areas and into areas where everybody is a stranger to one another. One of the things that both Gagan and Mays, as well as a couple of other people I'm going to talk about, is the way that land connects to capital in this time period. So one of the things that I think defines Grace's life very strongly is she doesn't have many connections. So as she's going about making connections, everything is so vital to her. One of the reasons that she agrees... So when Mary Whitney uh, succumbs to the trauma of her abortion, the lady of the house asks Grace, do you know what happened? Uh, Grace lies and says no. But she does hint at the fact that she knows because she says... All Mary ever said was, you would be very upset if you knew who it was. And that, in kind of the setting, and as you watch the scene in the show, you can see that Grace is indicating that she knows it's the son of the household. And the offer that she's given is, if you don't say anything about this and you'll swear on the Bible, I'll increase your wages, and should you ever choose to depart from here, I'll give you a good letter of reference. The letter of reference is the most significant thing. The letter of reference is the closest thing that she's going to have to class mobility, because if she wants to attain better work, she needs something that will speak to her reputation. So being not born in Canada, being an immigrant, and granted this is still a very... Uh, immigrant society. Certainly in the urban areas, at least, obviously we have to acknowledge that uh, pre-Confederation Canada had many indigenous peoples. That's not the setting that this show participates in. I don't want to undermine that part of history, it's just not depicted in the show. But the process of class stratification is slowed in this time period, Gorgon and Mays argue, because populations are so unstable. And they're unstable for a lot of reasons. They're unstable because you've got a huge influx of labor. You also have decades of lack of labor. You've got disease, but you've also got really high birth rates in this time period. So the instability of population makes class stratification more difficult to track because class stratification comes through generations. Specific to the story of Grace that we see, you talked about her father and the fact that her father is very quick to get her working. In that way, the anecdote that Margaret Atwood writes about a woman living in pre-Confederation into around Confederation era Canada 
that's a good representative of the period. In general, Gagan and Mays argue that parents were willing to place children in service as a necessity of household function. You had to have people working. Particularly immigrant families who are in this weird flux where industrialization has been happening, urbanization has been happening. If you can't quite urbanize in continental Europe or in the British Isles, perhaps you're coming over. Industrialization isn't happening in the same ways there, but you also don't have the traditions of guild membership, you don't have the same artisan traditions. So farming and having land capital is very important. When you look at the dichotomy between being in a town versus being in a rural area, which is the two main working situations that Grace is in in this series, uh, at least prior to her incarceration, we know that she does work in some other ways while she's incarcerated. Within towns, which is her first working situation, Servants could be expected to be paid more regularly. They could be expected to be paid more assuredly. Yeah. However, rural areas in general offered more opportunities for the accumulation of wealth, which makes it very appealing in this era. You talked about the fact that these young women are trying to supply their own dowries and are trying to gain an amount of wealth that they can start something out of. And there's a very idealistic uh, kind of, I suppose it would perhaps be the 1840s, 1850s version of the house with a white picket fence and two cars in the garage. Mary talks about how, and this is a younger version of Mary, this is Grace recounting kind of the friendship that's born out of them first meeting. But she's got this, she's going to have a, a farm with a house and a Jersey cow for the cream because it's the best cream. And she's going to have a very particular type of chicken that she likes. It does show that there is still that ideal baked into this time period that there's opportunities to be had in this developing branch of the British Empire. That being said, Ontario's economy, according to Gargan and Mays, is still essentially a barter economy prior to 1850. They talk about a, quote, system not quite incorporated into international economy. And we see that a little bit depicted in the show in the way that wages are paid, in the way that credit is paid. Grace comes to work in this new household. Like, it's almost expected, and it's not really depicted as being a huge deal, that she's advanced a portion of her wages so that she can be properly dressed. Obviously, that being a significant thing, and again, playing into reputation as well. But debt is a huge and inescapable part of life in this period. Something that I appreciated you bringing up is you talked about Grace's literacy. Again, Gargan and Mays, I really liked this article. It will be linked below. Within the British Empire in this time period, once industrialization starts, once the Factory Act starts, once the Schooling Act starts, there is this expectation of primary school or a grammar school. There's this expectation that young humans are going to be educated. And certainly part of the want for that education is that it gives their parents the opportunities to work in the industrializing situation. Something I find very interesting is women and children were paid less for the same amount of work than men were. And what this actually created was a reality where men couldn't find jobs. Because who is going to hire the candidate who wants X amount per hour when there is another candidate who will take X minus a third per hour, minus a half per hour, uh, however the math works out. That being said, in this time period, school is generally not expected beyond 10 or 12 years of age, simply out of need for labor. And we talked about the need for labor being a driving force of social development in this period in our last episode, so I don't want to harp on that too much. Well, and I think it's also interesting to note how Grace's upbringing sort of brought into that because her family isn't rich. They're very working class. They immigrated over to Canada for a better life. Her mother, she married below her class. 
supposedly out of love. It turned out to be a very bad relationship. But she taught her children. Like, so she was taught to be to fit into society. I have one other person that I'm going to start to cite in this a little bit. And in this way, I, I'm mostly just tipping my hat to Margaret Atwood. There is, uh, I'll, I'll mention again that I only watched the series. I didn't read the novel in preparation for this. One of the things that traditionally has been very ingrained into our understanding of Ontario's history on the history of Upper Canada is the idea, and it's actually prevalent enough that it's referred to as Pentland's thesis, uh, the scholar who really popularized it. A lot of the historiography of this time period understands that after 1840, land is much more difficult for immigrants to acquire, and those who are born here are at a slight advantage because of the accumulation of wealth. This is proposed as being partially the result of the influx of Irish farming laborers and industrial skilled Scots and English in the decades prior to this. However, something to keep in mind throughout the 19th century is Canada is still very much a resource extraction. It doesn't really mirror British rates of industrialization, and that I think is something that we could very easily get into a false heuristic. Yes. Because we see a lot of period places that take place in London, or Birmingham, or these British industrial centers. And the clothing in this series, and the architecture style in this series, very closely mimic what we're used to seeing in those. So, again, to the lay watcher, you might get a false understanding that the Industrial Revolution is happening here, too. It's not really. De Roche, in his book Class in 19th Century Central Ontario, subtitle, A Reassessment of the Crisis and Demise of Small Populations During Early Industrialization, 1861 to 1871. He talks about how uh, both sociologists and historians have a tendency to view small property owners who are either pharmacists Pharmazins. What two words did I just mash together there, Victoria? Friend, we both know that I wouldn't know. Farmers and artisans. Hey, you know what? I like it. Farmers. I want merch with that. It's a farmer <laughs> with an art palette. And then should, I just want a, like a picture of a farmer with an art palette. Pharmazin. I mean, that's not really what an artisan is in this time period, but sure. You know what? I'm glad we're having this conversation because we should acknowledge farmers. I think we get what farmers do. Yes. Artisans in this time period are skilled craftspeople. They're essentially good at everything that factories later replace. So whether that's woodworking, metallurgy. It's weird because you talk about artisans and like it feels very medieval. Like you think of a blacksmith. But like who cobblers. Barrels. Everything is being transported in barrels in this time period. Coopers are still yes. vital. Lace work, hugely vital. Crochet, we still can't crochet on a machine. We can knit on a machine, we cannot crochet on a machine. Those sorts of things. Artisans being non-industrialized craftspeople. In this time period, we have the idea that the small producers, the artisans, the provincial farmer, also known as the petite bourgeoisie, if you want to get into that critique and that lens. We have the idea that in this time period of industrialization, the petite bourgeoisie are being squeezed into one of two polarizations, and they're not being divided 50-50. You see the concentration of capital, and you see a much larger totalitarian class, or working class. So some artisans will go on to be the upper class, the majority will fall into lower labor classes. However, what Durach talks about in his reassessment of class in 19th century Ontario is that this is perhaps a false impression. He argues that small farm holdings were not in decline, that petty property and home ownership were indeed common among laborers and especially the artisans who remain. Oddly enough, this show demonstrates that. Because according to the Petland 
thesis that has been popular. It wouldn't make much sense for Jamie Walsh to end up with his own farm. Uh, we know that he doesn't inherit the land from his father. It's stated in exposition that he acquires his own farm, that he acquires his own wealth that way. Certainly he's coming from an upper class. He's coming from a property-owning family. But the fact that Grace, after decades of being imprisoned, decades past, we're well into the late 1860s, if not the 1870s. At the end of the series, we know this because Simon Jordan is drafted into the American Civil War. So this series actually supports that thesis and demonstrates that small farm holdings are not disappearing and that they do continue to persist in this period. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to note that also Grace had this whole picture of what she wanted her life to be like. And that I think part of me wants to think that maybe this whole section with Jamie Walsh, that's her making another myth for uh, for Simon Jordan. Because maybe that's English major in me, but I'm like, oh yeah, that is 100% the English major in you. However, this is the period in time where Protestant work ethic is really taking root and where capitalism is turning monetary success in life into evidence of virtue. So I think that there is something historical and sociological to be said for if this character's motivation within the society she lives in is to show herself redeemed. The fact that she goes on to work, the fact that it's stated that she and Jamie Wash as a household could afford hired help, but she doesn't want that. There is something to be said for the Protestant work ethic that is specific to the period of industrialization, but also very specific to the colonial um, myth. Even like the American dream. Yeah. The American dream. There is very scant evidence about Grace's life, but one thing is that she ended up immigrating to America because she just couldn't get away from her past in Canada. Anyways, it's just sort of like that dream that society has. That idea of what the Canadian and American dream is, is that there it's the white picket fence life that we make a life for ourselves and that we're somehow successful. Because it's so very close to the image that Grace sets up for herself and or as Mary Whitney set up for herself with the Jersey cow. Yeah, and I think that it's Margaret Atwood, uh, again, showing a very good historical understanding of what an ideal life would look like to someone in this time period. Yes. And also it's a way of just getting uh, the person studying the show to also question Grace and her sort of storytelling. Is she telling the truth or is she not? And I think we're going to get more back into that uh, in our next episode. But it, I, again, we don't actually care about Grace in this. No, but I just think it's because she's making a story. She, and with spiritualism and stuff like that, they are trying to tell a story. History is layered, the show is layered, and it reflects that really well. Um, I could talk on and on about this show because it, a lot of the topics we talk about are just so interconnected with each other in this series. And I mean, that's to be expected. We are trying to take an interdisciplinary approach, whether that's a gendered feminist approach, whether that's a sociological approach. I didn't uh, want to take us off track with it, but your discussion of like, fitting yourselves into culture. Like, my friends who like classical and post-structuralist theory, when George Simmel is talking about cultivating your personage, or when Michel Foucault is talking about cultivating your personage, those both matter. Yes, and this show is shows just how oftentimes, like, in order to make ourselves, help ourselves move forward in society throughout history, we create a story for ourselves, trying to make ourselves seem somehow different than we were raised to be, and also trying to make ourselves seem more palatable. And this show does a good job of showing the social values by showing the way the characters make themselves palatable. I think that's what you're trying to get at in terms of understanding of a historical society. Awesome. Well, that is the B side of this. We have a C coming, so look forward to that. In the next episode, Victoria and I are going to be talking a little bit about criminology, a little bit about early psychological theory, and a little bit about uh, ooky spooky stuff, aka spiritualism. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much for everybody who's continuing to listen, and uh, we hope you guys have a great day.
Yes, thank you. We really appreciate you, all of you. Seriously. Yes. Citations, episode notes in the description, all our social medias down there, our emails down there. We have yet to get an email. And at this point, if you just sent me a waving hand emoji, because Gmail lets you do that, it would make my day. Or maybe send us a picture of a farmer with a paint palette. Put, put Victoria's name in the subject line if you're going to do that. Yes. Yeah. Victoria, some art. Gift. It could be a bad Photoshop. I'd be very content. I know what an artisan is. Is that just that my brain? That's where I went to. Um, yes. And, uh, yeah, social media is on there. So if, if you don't want to email, you can give us a shout out on there. We have a Patreon down there. Uh, if you feel like doing that, we would definitely appreciate it. We do shout outs. We are going to be running our first vote for an episode topic pretty soon here in the next couple of months. So if you would like to get that perk from Patreon, now would be the time to pursue that. Otherwise, just everybody have a great day. Just have yeah. a great day. Do something that doesn't make you sad today. I'm not going to tell yes. you to, to make yourself happy. Just do something that doesn't make you sad today. Eat a cookie. Eat a cookie. Yeah. Or read a book. Read a nice book. I don't know. Make a very bad Photoshop picture. Sometimes the worst Photoshops are like, they just bring joy. Make a bad Photoshop picture. <laughs> Watch it. Watch a couple episodes of Alias Grace if you aren't doing that already. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Before we sign off, Sloan and I would like to acknowledge this podcast and all the content we create are located and produced on Treaty 6 territory. This land has traditionally and continues to be a home, place of gathering, and meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. This includes the Nakota Sioux, Nitsitapi, Métis, Salto, and Cree First Nations.